Right, I wondered whether there are any encouraging stories, be brave now, uh, in this last week as a result of anything to do with um, Try Praying. Has anyone got any encouraging stories that they would be willing to share with this very small, cuddly, nice group of people? You don't have to come up here, you can stay in your seat if you want. Anything, anything at all. You got one, Chloe? Amazing. Um, so I was at university this past week, and luckily for me, I get to go to Lee Abbey to do those block weeks, which is incredible in um, Lynmouth. And um, the theme of the week was radical welcome and hospitality and how we can be people who radically welcome the outcast and the stranger and the people that we don't particularly like. And it was a big challenge. And one of the mornings we had a lady talk to us about... Um, hosting a Ukrainian family at her like crazy big farm in mid-Devon and she was hosting a family of 12 um, and it was like a massive challenge to hear that story but she also just asked us to to pray for practical things in that morning so we all gather in the morning and worship and pray together and she just said pray for visas because this the process you have to go through to get the people here is horrendous and really hard um, and yeah, so we prayed really fervently for visas to come through. A couple had already come through, but a family of 12 is a big deal. And um, later on, our director, Paul, he came to us and said, you know, Bridget called me crying um, just now saying that after we prayed this morning, five of their visas came through. And I was like, God is so good. Like, you know, it doesn't always have to be those crazy, like, I don't know, things that happen, but just those practical things that, that make radical hospitality and welcome easier for us. Um, and that was really encouraging for us as a group um, who were there. So, yeah, five visas. Amen. Amazing. God answers prayer, doesn't he? Not always how we want, but hopefully. Um, just to do with the try praying, really, just um, there was somebody that, that hasn't been many times came to church last week and uh, sat chatting with her. And I just said, oh, why don't you try praying? <laughs> um, and I said, you know, take that away. You do it. You read it this week, I'll read it this week, and then we'll, we'll chat together. She's not actually here today, but um, hopefully she's taken that away and is, is having a go. I just thought, yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Amazing. Sally, yes. I was worried I'd be left standing here looking like a lemon. Um, we've been praying, not just in our home group, but I know loads of people in the church have been praying for Eva, um, who... Um, uh, went through a very rough time recently and um, praise God that she's with us today and that her baby is safe still inside her and we pray that that will continue. Amazing. Amen. Awesome. Any more? It's not too late. <laughs> yes, Summer. So I wasn't here last week so I don't know actually about the booklet but... Um, <laughs> But my drama teacher actually had, um, he had to go back to, he had to miss a week of school and go back to Australia because uh, his mum was going, she was really ill and she had to go under um, like a big surgery, I think it was like on her heart. And um, me and two of my friends who both go to youth group, we told him on the last day before he left that we'd pray for him and his mum. And at youth group we prayed and he told us on Tuesday, on Monday, actually, that when, bef right before she went into surgery, he held her hand and he said to her, I've got three girls back at home praying for you. And, um, like, and she looked at him and she said, like, thank you, that means the most to me. And she was okay and she's recovering now. Um, but yeah, that was really powerful. <laughs> Well, that's crazy because I've spent the day with Mr. Carroll today, uh, who is Summer's drama teacher, uh, and he's coming over later on. Um, and if we didn't have services at this time, I wouldn't have been able to spend the day with him today. And his son's going to come for a sleepover because uh, he's in Otis's class at school. So uh, keep praying for Mr. and Mrs. Carroll. <laughs> They're really lovely. Um, great. Any others? Yes. Yeah. This is really weird for me. I never want to publicly speak. But um, just 
Thank you, Sally, for introducing what's been going on. I wasn't quite ready to share all of that, but I just wanted to share that um, on Tuesday, my fluid around my baby was at two centimeters, and then I saw that Rose had put out, you know, specifically for everyone to pray for the fluid to increase. And when I went on Friday, the sonographer was so surprised because there was like eight centimeters, and she just was like, wow, your fluid has really increased. And I just like thought about the fact that my church has been praying for me. And um, it's just super powerful. Um, they weren't expecting that. I mean, and it can change, but just even in that moment, it just meant everything to me. So yeah, big thank you. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, not what you want your waters to break at 28 weeks, is it? Um, amazing, Claire. Seeing as Eva has, I'll do it. Okay, um, well, I guess a lot of you know that I haven't been seeing my children, and okay, seeing, I guess a lot of you know that I haven't been seeing my girls and that they haven't been living with me, and I saw a lot of them over the Easter holidays, and it was just lovely, um, and I w wasn't allowed to see them until May half term, and I won't go into details, but Beth suddenly sent me a text last night at, I don't know, quarter to six. Mum, I want to see you on Monday. I'm like, Beth? No. Yeah, why? Okay, what were you going to do? And she said, um, I want to see you on Monday. I really want to see you on Monday. I've told Dad it's a day off school because it's bank holiday. So he's got he's to gotta like it because it's a day off school. I want to see you on Monday. <laughs> I only shared that because... Eva shared hers, so me and Eva are kind of like, well, if she shares something, I'm kind of like, okay, God kind of prompts me to too. Partners in crime. Praise God. Thank you. Right. Any others? Yeah, Mona. Hi, just to link on the visa situation. <laughs> so we haven't been home five years, to, to back to South Africa. Um, and the here COVID struck 2020, July, was supposed to be the summer that we're going to try and go back to South Africa. Um, my mom was here June 2018. So that's the last time she was here. And then we, yeah, so that's the last time we saw our family. Um, so then COVID struck, and then it just becomes more and more expensive and all the PCRs and all of that. Um, so with things lifting slightly in January, I was like, this is going to be the summer <laughs> we're going to get home. But then South African passport ran out, British passports ran out. <laughs> I had to go to London, and they say it can take no November, I went to London to renew my passport. Um, they can take six months to 12 months for the South African passport. Anyway, I got a few people praying, and my children have been praying every night before bedtime, my family back home. So, um, long story short, my South African passport is ready in London. Um, I had to send my old South African passport to the British passport office um, before they could renew my British passport. That then got sort of lost in the post. Big stress because I need that passport to get the one in London. <laughs> anyway, kept praying. I've got my British passport now. I'm just waiting for the old South African passport to arrive in the post, and then hopefully I can go and get the one in London. And then a friend very because then it was financially, how am I going? You know, how are we going to get home? And a friend kindly offered. Again, it's just it's just God because I phoned her and spoke to her about something completely different that's going on in my life. And she asked, when, when last were you home? I said, well, five years ago. And she said, well, God's given her this money. <laughs> and she's been offering it to a few people. And I keep saying no. And I'll probably gonna say no. But she's offered to help play, pay for flights. So as soon as I got those passports, then we can book some flights. And we can go and see our family. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Amazing. Yeah. A much needed visit home uh, for those guys. All right. Um, let's, let's pray, shall we? Let's pray now. Father God, we, uh, we just want to thank you that you are the living God, that this isn't just a social club, that we are here to worship the living God. 
Father, thank you that um, we can know you because of what Christ has done on the cross. Uh, that our relationship with you is one of um, oh, just <laughs> joy and uh, just that the, the way in which we deepen our relationship with you is through prayer. Lord, thank you that you speak through your word to us um, and that we can commune with you uh, through prayer. Lord God, thank you. Um, would you encourage us with more stories of hope like this? Uh, would you build our faith? Would you build our confidence and our courage and our hope in you? Such that when uh, the opportunities arise, that we will be bold in offering to pray for others. That we would be bold in introducing people to Jesus. Um, we just thank you. Thank you that you're in the business of making things whole through Christ. Amen. Uh, that's it. Um, oh well, look, I'll, I just want to plug this again. So if you if you haven't got one of these, um, hopefully there's a few out in the foyer. Uh, we'll dig them out if they're not there already. Um, and if we run out, please let me know because we'll just order some more. That'd be great. So the idea with these is it's a seven-day uh, prayer guide aimed at unchurched, unreligious people. Uh, the idea is that we use them first as a fellowship, as believers. Uh, hopefully that it will reinvigorate our own prayer life and that perhaps the Lord would lay on your heart people that you would then be able to hand this on to. Um, so we use it first, pray over it first and then give it away. So pray and then give away. Uh, that's the plan. And you may have noticed that there's uh, banners and posters and adverts up in the bus stops and on the buses uh, all the way from Biddeford round to Ilfracombe. Um, so it's a churches together uh, thing as well, which is great. Oh yes, there is an app too. So if you've got a smartphone, uh, there's a free Try Praying app, which is basically this booklet on your phone. Um, really, really useful as well. So yeah, thank you. Um, good. And uh, yeah, as we just prayed, um, you know that as Christians, one of the wonders is that we get to know God we get to know the living God. Um, and um, the primary way that our relationship with God deepens is through prayer, isn't it? Um, and so it'd be really, really good, I thought, to have a little look at how the Apostle Paul prays. Because uh, I'm guessing he probably knew God better than me and probably better than us. Um, and we know how he prays, fortunately, because it's recorded in Scripture for us. So um, uh, Molly uh, read that passage for us, a formidable passage, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you want to have that open in front of you, you can do. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, in, this, uh, in the booklet on page 7, there's this this prayer that just really struck me that is really, really simple. And I think it's the prayer that the founder prayed uh, before he met Jesus. And it was simply this, God, if you're there, and I'm not sure that you are, but if you are, I want to know you. I don't want to fool myself. I want to really know you. So as I pray, pray, please make yourself known to me. And it just, yeah, uh, occurred to me that it'd be great for us to look at uh, the way that Paul prayed, um, because he knew God, didn't he? And we know God, um, but if we want to know him more, and we want to know him in a deeper way, uh, then it would probably be great to have a look at how Paul prayed. So, uh, here we are, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through to 11. And um, you'll notice that Paul says in verse 11, uh, he says, with this in mind we constantly pray for you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. And so it begs the question, with what in mind, Paul? 
what are you talking about? And he's evidently talking about the verses just before that, just before verse 11. So from through, uh, sorry, verse 3 through to verse 10, uh, this is what he has in mind as he comes to pray. And so, in a sense, what Paul has in his mind is uh, like a framework. It's what Don Carson says. Um, he calls it a, a framework that Paul is using when he prays. It's like a framework that Paul hangs his prayers on, if you like. Um, and so we thought we'd have a little look at this framework. With this in mind, uh, he's referring to everything that he said from verses 3 to 10. And so we're going to have a quick look at what that looks like. Uh, what shapes and guides and frames Paul's prayer. And we'll see as, you, as we look at this together, that there's two main things that come out. Uh, two main things which shape Paul's prayer. The first one is thanks, thanksgiving, thanksgiving. And the second one is a confidence, a confidence uh, to live for the world that is to come, a confidence that Jesus is coming back. Uh, so thankfulness and confidence. And if you take nothing else away from this, then uh, let it be this, that your prayer life would be energized with those two things. That when perhaps you don't know where to start in prayer, when you don't feel like praying, begin by thanking God. Because uh, no matter how hard life is, no matter how painful life might be for you, no matter how sad life might be, there will always be things that we can thank God for, things that will make us profoundly thankful to God. It might be just as simple as the sound of birdsong or the breath in your lungs. It might be friendships. The point is once you begin thanking God, it snowballs into more and more. It's a great place to start. And it's all ultimately rooted in what Christ has done for us. What he has secured for us. What he is continuing to work out in us. And that leads on to the confidence which Paul goes on to talk about. So first of all, thankfulness. And let's just have a quick look at what Paul gives thanks for. Uh, in verse 3, look, he gives thanks for an increase in faith and an increase in love. And he gives thanks in verse 4 for the perseverance of the Thessalonians. And this really, really challenged me um, because it, it challenges uh, the way that <laughs> I frame my prayers. Uh, many of my prayers are for my or for other people's situations to get better. For people to be delivered from the tough times that they might be going through. And there's nothing wrong with that. Paul says elsewhere, pray for all things, all the time, uh, in all ways. But so often, my prayers are tied to the material well-being and comfort of the here and now, either for me or for other people. Whereas Paul is thanking God that the Thessalonians' faith is increasing, that their dependence on God is growing. That's the first thing he thanks God for, that their trust in him is deepening. And it's helpful, I think, even just from these verses, to be reminded that faith isn't a thing. It's not a static thing that some people have got and some people haven't. That some people have got lots of and other people will never have much of. No, it's a growing thing. God grows faith in us. It's not that Paul reveres the super spiritual believers for their great faith. No, he gives thanks to God for growing the faith of the Thessalonians. And that's an encouragement to me because when I feel like I don't have much faith, I can rest assured that as I continue walking through this Christian walk, God will grow faith 
in me and he'll do it in you too. Paul also thanks God that their love, the love of the Thessalonians, for one another is growing. He thanks God that their increasing trust in Jesus results in more love for one another. He thanks God that they are persevering through tough times as well. So often our prayers are for ourselves or others to be uh, delivered or removed from tough times or for tough times to stop. And maybe we think that tough times must come from the devil and so we must pray against them. Well, Paul doesn't do that here uh, in this passage. He thanks God. (laughs) In fact, he boasts about the perseverance of these Thessalonian believers. He boasts about their perseverance in tough times. He's not boasting in his own church planting abilities. He's not going, check out this great church that I've planted. He's boasting in what God is doing through those believers. He's effectively saying, check out how powerfully the grace of God is working in their lives. How it enables them to persevere even through tough times. Check out how their growing faith and their growing love for one another enables them to press on even when times are savagely tough. And so, I don't know about you, but this really challenges me. Now, when I pray through the church directory for each of you, I thank God for the signs of grace in your lives. For the growing faith and the love that you have for one another. And some of you, I know, and I won't make any eye contact now, are going through extraordinarily tough times. I thank God for the way that I can see faith and love and perseverance growing in you. And I'm going to thank God for the things that I see in people where they are becoming more like Jesus. And dare I say it, the times we become more like Jesus most are the tough times. I wish that wasn't the case, (laughs) but I think it is. And so I dare you to try the same thing. Try praying uh, for love and faith and perseverance to increase. And try and pick out the things that you see in people where they're becoming more like Jesus. And thank God for those things. So firstly, Paul's prayer is shaped by thanks. Um, So let's thank God for believers around us who are becoming more like Jesus. Um, Secondly, Paul's prayer is shaped by confidence. Paul is clearly living for the world to come. He has his eyes firmly fixed on a different reality to the one that's around him, to the one that people who are making life so hard for believers are living for. His confidence is in Christ's return. And he's able to thank God for their perseverance in tough times because it's evidence that they have been counted worthy, that they have been rescued from this world for the world to come. So when it says in verse 5 that this is evidence that God's judgment is right and as a result you'll be counted worthy, he's not saying that they have earned their right to enter the kingdom of God. What he's saying, rather, is that their perseverance demonstrates that God has already given them the right to enter the kingdom of God. So Paul has got this tremendous confidence in Christ's return, and it shapes the way he prays. It forms a framework about how he prays. This is his focus. He lives for it, and he comforts the believers who are being 
persecuted in their faith, that they will be accepted by God on account of his grace, whereas their persecutors will not. He's reminding them and encouraging them that they will be vindicated. They are doing the right thing. They should not give up. They will be given relief. Christ will be glorified in them, while those who have been working hard against God's people will be punished. These are hard words to read, aren't they? There is no in-between. In the end, people will either know him or they won't. Christ's glory, which can already be seen at work in God's people's lives, which has already begun to change those who believe, increasing their faith, increasing their love for one another, increasing their perseverance in tough times, will ultimately be seen in full when he returns. And those who refuse to know him now will be in trouble. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? And so as we pray through these booklets as a church, thank God for the signs of his glorious grace that you see in the lives of your brothers and sisters. Be confident in his return when he will come in judgment to set things straight. And ask the Lord to lay on your heart people who don't yet know him. Prayer is the way that they will come to know him through Christ. Ask the Lord to lay people on your heart. People who you can pray for that they will come to trust in him as their Lord and Savior. Pray for opportunities to talk to people who he will send your way. Whether it's people you know or whether it's people you've never met before, pray for divine appointments because these dangerous times that we live in now as we approach Christ's return, these are dangerous times for those who don't know him. Time is running out. And so pray a dangerous prayer. Father, who would you have me pray for this week? Father, would you arrange an appointment with someone this week who needs to hear about Jesus? Would you arrange an appointment with me with someone this week where it will be so clear that you have brought them to hear about Jesus that I will have no choice but to share him with them. <laughs> Pray that dangerous prayer. So uh, be reminded that Paul prays with thanksgiving for the way that he sees Christ working in other people's hearts and lives. Paul prays with confidence that Christ is coming back. And may that fuel our prayer for other people, that they would come into that same relationship with Jesus, that they would find that same confidence. Um, let's pray, and then I'll, I'll hand back over to you.